I'm Bill Dutton, I'm director of the Crowell Center, and I want to welcome everyone here. This is the uh, sort of the, uh, feature event of uh, a series of events we're having for the 20th anniversary of the Crowell Center. It was founded in 1998, and uh, my colleagues and I, when we were sitting around the table thinking about what could we do to uh, uh, think about the last 20 years of, of the Quello Center and the last 20 years of media, information, and communication policy, it, it became evident that one of the major developments over those 20 years that has changed the whole landscape of media, information, and communication has been the internet. Of course, the internet was born before then, but it was certainly uh, uh, a game changer. And, and in, over the last four years as director of the Quello Center, my whole goal has been to try to bring the Quello Center faster into the digital age. <laughs> and it's because of the role of the internet that we're having to move in that direction so fast. And so, so of course, if the internet is the elephant in the room, what uh, immediately came to mind was, of course, Ben Sir. And uh, he is uh, variously called one of the fathers of the internet, uh, clearly a, a pioneer in, in internet space with TCP, IP protocol development, and the architecture of the internet I mean, with him and, and a lot of the yeah. colleague. Uh, but it, another term, the most common term that came up on, in the Twitter sphere when, they, when people learned that Ben Surf was going to be here was hero. <laughs> it was amazing. So, uh, so uh, it's just our pleasure to have him here today. Uh, ben has won so many prestigious awards that I really cannot name them all. I think you can Google this. I think you can Google this. <laughs> but to give you a sense of the perspective, uh, uh, 29 honorary degrees were had been awarded for them, and uh, many of us have not had any <laughs> So, uh, so it's just absolutely incredible. He is currently, I will go through his, all of his past roles, but he's currently Vice President of Google and Chief Internet Evangelist. Uh, we asked him, when I, when I first approached him, I said, Ben, please, we want somebody to talk about the last 20 years of the internet and the next 20 years of the internet. Now that's easy enough. And, uh, and but I, obviously no one in the world can deal with the full scope of this, but if anybody can, uh, Ben didn't blink an eye. And, uh, of course, I'd love to do this. And as we look towards the future of the internet, it is true that I, we have never needed an internet evangelist more. Uh, there's so many issues being raised about social media and the internet and the web that uh, we need to uh, take a step back and look at the big picture and the way brings us and problems as well as the opportunities. For this. So may we welcome uh, the hero of the internet. my day in the room, considering that school is over, so uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us on this pretty spring day. Uh, I'm going to try to break this into a couple of pieces. Uh, there's a fair number of slides that are of historical character, and my intent is not to dwell too much, but I wanted to give you a flavor of uh, the origins of the network and what we were thinking at the time, some of the anecdotes of, uh, that occurred during the development of the internet. But then the last several slides are packed uh, with issues that need to be unpacked and need to be wrestled with. So I'll do my best to time myself. I'm going to try and leave about 15 minutes for Q&A. Just as a warning, I wear two hearing aids, and uh, the acoustics in this room may or may not work out well for me when you're asking questions. So I may end up running around in the room getting close enough to look for you I have to, so don't, you know, panic, I don't buy your spin or whatever. <laughs> At least not on purpose. So, uh, so you should be prepared for that. Uh, let me uh, just start out by showing you a picture that was taken in 1994. This was the 25th anniversary of the ARPANET. This is the predecessor to the internet. And uh, you see a bunch of people in here, I won't go through all the names. Some of you may actually recognize, some of you may not. 
But this group of people, uh, among others, were really core to the development of that first large-scale packet switch network technology. Um, and as you can uh, see, uh, Bob Taylor, who used to run ARPA, IPTO, uh, Larry Roberts, who ran the ARPANET project for ARPA, my time up just above me, Bob Kahn, over here, my art man, the engineering group at Boulder, and Eddie Newman. And it keeps going back. Some of these people have passed away, some of them are still around, and amazingly, a lot of the old parts are still part of it. I mean, it's really amazing how this, this technology grabs you and just drags you along. And so here I am, still, what am I going to say, still partying. So here we are. Uh, at UCLA uh, in 1969. I'm a graduate student at UCLA. I'm working for Len Kleinrock in the Network Measurement Center. My job is to program the software for a Sigma 7 to connect to the first packet switch called an interface message processor from Volker and Akademi, which was delivered to UCLA in September, and then in subsequent months we have three more. So we have a four node network roughly by uh, the end of uh, December of 1969. Uh, of course, the uh, Sigma 7 is in a museum somewhere now, and uh, some people think I should be there too, but there I am. <laughs> so that was the first four node ARPANET, uh, and Bob Kahn came out to uh, UCLA uh, late in December or early in January, and he and I worked together to wreck the network uh, as, as often as we could. Bob had ideas that the protocols of the, of the ARPANET were not going to work the way they were supposed to. And his colleagues in Boulder and England said, no, you're wrong. The probability of this happening would be like all the oxygen molecules collecting in the corner of the room and we all asphyxiate. So he and I proceeded to wreck the network uh, repeatedly to demonstrate that in fact he was right that there were protocols and algorithms that needed to be revised. So this is what a packet switch looked like uh, in uh, 1969. It was the size of a refrigerator it was delivered to UCLA in a very heavy metal container. Both Baron Mech and Newman knew they were doing this work for the Defense Department, and they knew that it was going into an extremely hostile environment surrounded by graduate students and undergraduates. <laughs> so it was in this heavy metal container. Uh, today, a packet switch looks like that, that thing on the wall, or even smaller, something you can hold in your hand. But that's what the electronics of the day uh, provided us. On the 25th anniversary of the ARPANET, um, my colleagues uh, Steve Crocker and John Fossell and I posed to this whole day to do this. And this is for Newsweek. They wanted to do something to demonstrate how primitive networking was back in the day, in the late 60s. So we went and spent the whole day finding zucchinis and yellow squash and stringing it all together, getting five pound coffee tins, and then drawing all the stuff in the back. And you'll notice this was a, a deep joke for the people who got it. You'll notice that this network would never work because it's ear to ear and mouth to mouth, but there's no mouth to ear. So this is <laughs> that, that was our little, little deep joke in this week magazine. Uh, now, um, this was at SRI International. Um, when Bob Kahn uh, did the original art network with his colleagues and with some of us, um, and then joined ARPA, he very quickly realized that it, uh, the Defense Department was going to use computers in command and control, which is what was driving some of the thinking behind the successful application of packet switching. He realized that the ARPANET, which was built by dedicated phone lines connecting packet switches to each other, would not work if we put computers in mobile vehicles and ships at sea and airplanes. That you know the ships would get all tangled up and the tanks would run over the wires and the planes would never get off the tarmac. So we had to use radio and satellite in order to build a truly comprehensive global command and control system uh, using computers in all of those various uh, vehicles and locations. So he began uh, work on a mobile packet radio network and a packet satellite network for a wide, a wide uh, area of communications. SRI International in uh, Menlo Park, California built a packet radio band, which you see over on the left hand side of the screen. And part of my job as the program manager at ARPA was to bring the military out from time to time for the religious experience of getting into the van, driving around the Bayshore area, parking under a bridge, getting into radio shadow, having the packet stream stop. Then as you drive out from under the bridge, the packet stream picks up again. So we have this retransmission robustness. And most of these guys would get out feeling like they had experienced something very different from what they were accustomed to. 
in the field with the sort of crappy radios that they have, uh, analog radios. So the packet radio map is a very important part of this picture. This is what it looked like inside. Those white boxes are about a cubic foot. They cost $50,000 each. They're a packet radio, so it's the things you carry in your pocket today. Uh, and in this particular van, um, we, uh, we also were experimenting with packetized voice and packetized video. We're talking about the early 1970s. So we had ambitions to do voice, video, and data. There's good reason for that. It's command and control, we need all three. However, we couldn't do very much of it because the data rates that were available were very limited. The ARPANET backbone was running at 50 kilobits a second, and that's a dial-up modem today. Uh, but that was high speed back in the late 60s and early 70s. The packet radio program uh, system ran at between 100 and 400 kilobits a second, depending on how much coding you were doing. And the packet satellite network had a 64 kilobit share channel, so we're running fairly low data rates now. So in order to do voice, uh, we decided that we would use compression methods to reduce what would normally be a 64 kilobit stream down to 1800 bits a second. Now when you compress down to that level, you lose a certain amount of quality. And so anyone who spoke through the packet voice system sounded like a drum in your <laughs> And I remember uh, the day came when I'm in Washington now running the program and I'm supposed to demonstrate the packet voice system to a bunch of generals. And I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this. And then I remember that one of the participants in the packet voice program was Ingmar Lewis from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. So we had Ingmar speak through the standard voice network, then we had him speak through our packet, no, packet voice network, and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't tell the generals that everybody would say it that way. So uh, we have, I guess the point I want to make is that even in those early days of uh, ARPANET and internet, uh, we had ambitions which are reflected today of what you're seeing. It's just that the level, the quality, the quantity was very, very much less, but nonetheless, we were pulling. So uh, Bob and I uh, wrote our first article in May of 1974 that described the internet. And in 97, uh, Bill Clinton uh, awarded both of us the National Medal of Technology. And I just want to remind you that that uh, Bob Curran was the guy that started the program at ARC and invited me to participate. And so for those of you who are discussing you younger folks, you never know when an opportunity is going to be career changing. That one was certainly so for me for the last 40 years plus. So I'm very grateful to Bob for having invited me to participate. Um, internet was where the original internet protocols were developed. And there was a plaque it was built. It's probably very hard to see. Maybe we can show some lights, but I just want you to appreciate two things. First of all, there's a whole lot of names here, and a lot of them are not U.S. names. The internet work was, was international from the very beginning. I had students uh, or, or visiting uh, faculty uh, on my campus in Stanford, in my lab, from Norway, from Japan, from England, or remotely participating from Norway. France, I had local uh, participation uh, the general, the general from India. So it's important when you hear people make assertions like the internet was strictly an American invention. It's not true. It was very much an international collaboration, and this plaque at Stanford was intended to recognize that. In 1977, I was running the program uh, from ARCA and felt the need to demonstrate that the TCP IP protocols would actually work with all three of the packet switch networks that, uh, that we had built uh, for purposes of demonstrating this uh, potentially global technology. So I, I asked for the, uh, the team to demonstrate from, uh, from San Francisco a packet radio band going up and down the major freeway, radiating packets through a gateway we called these things gateways between the nets because we didn't know they were supposed to be called routers. That was Cisco invented that term a little later. Anyway, so we had the gateway up there uh, taking the packets from the packet radio van, squirting them into the ARPANET, saying, this needs to go to USC Information Sciences Institute in Los Angeles. But we had uh, 
altered the routing tables and the gateways linking the various nets to each other to force the traffic to go into the ARPANET all the way across to Norway in an internal satellite link, then from Norway down to London on the dedicated 9.6 kilometer line, and then pop out of the ARPANET at Moon Hilly Downs to a satellite, to, through a gateway to a satellite ground station, go back across the Atlantic, which is a, another separate packet satellite channel in uh, Amosat 4A, and then land on the, the eastern part of the US in Ecamp, West Virginia, go back through another gateway into the ARPANET again, and then all the way across the ARPANET to Los Angeles. Now, if you do the math, uh, the distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles is probably 400 miles. But the packets were going up and down through two synchronous satellites and back and, forth, back and forth across the US and the Atlantic twice. So the packets were going 100,000 miles, roughly speaking, uh, while the distance that uh, we were really communicating over was only 100 miles. And it worked. And I remember sort of jumping up and down saying, it works, it works, in a way it couldn't possibly work. It's software, and it's a miracle, whatever software works. <laughs> so I'm very excited about this particular demo because it shows all three networks operating as if they were one you know, uniform thing, even though each of those networks was very different in terms of bandwidth, error rate, latency, uh, and the like. But we made it look like it's a uniform thing, which is what you see today whenever you log in to today's internet. Well, after the defense department demonstrated the technology and started um, implementing the uh, protocols on every operating system we could find, uh, we, Bob and I, essentially forced the ARPANET research community to adopt and use TCP IP. And we did this by a very simple uh, measure. First of all, we invested in getting TCP IP implemented on the IBM operating systems, digital operating systems, human hybrid operating systems, and units, and anything else we could find, uh, so that there wouldn't be any excuses from the people who were using the ARPANET, packet radio, and packet satellite now that they couldn't get TCP to run. They said, here it is. Uh, and then I announced uh, that in uh, January of 82, that is program manager, that on January 1, 1983, we would shut off all the old protocols, the network control protocols for the architect, to force everybody to use TCP IP so we could start building a multi-network system. And there was a lot of pissing and moaning about that. But uh, I had the people at ISI tracking how many implementations of TCP that were just by testing and probing. And I can see, though, know, there was a graph going, I guess, going up this way, until about summertime and then it sort of flattened out. So I called the Defense Communications Agency, which was running the ARPANET at the time, and I said, shut off the ability of the ARPANET to carry NCP and only allow it to carry TCP traffic or TCP IP traffic. So they did that for 24 hours. Of course, the phone rang off the hook. Are you idiots? What are you doing? My email doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, I just wanted to know if I can do that. Well, that, you know, that got some attention tonight. So the curve starts going up again. Around October or so, it flattened out again. So I called DCA and I said, shut it off for 48 hours. You know, and the phone went off again. But we managed to get to January with only a couple of hosts on the network unable to run TCP IP. How many hosts were there all together? About four hosts. So we were only doing a forced flag day to transfer to TCP IP on 400 machines. Today, we're talking billions of machines, and it's really hard to make anything like that happen. Now, NSF figures out around 1982 that this stuff might be useful for academic purposes. So it, it introduces something called CSNet, which was uh, largely, um, I would say, advocated by the uh, University of Wisconsin, Larry Landmer, and a couple of other folks. They adopted TCP IP for that computer science network, then decided that that they would build a national scale backbone called the MSF Net in order to link 3,000 universities around the US. And they very cleverly did this not by just building the backbone MSF Net, which you see there, but also 11 or 12 intermediate level networks. This was a practical decision. They didn't want the people running the MSF Net backbone to have to deal with 3,000 customers. So instead, they had 
intermediate level networks, which would deal with subsets of the universities geographically, and then those dozen or so uh, intermediate nets would then be connected to each other through the NSF network. And so that was an immensely successful uh, project. They got this thing fired up around 1986 or so, running at a megabit and a half instead of 50 kilobits, and eventually ramped up to uh, well past 155 megabits a second, and eventually into gigabit speeds. By the time uh, 1995 rolled around, however, there were commercial internet services in operation. And so in a very uh, dramatic move, NSF shut the NSF tech down. Now they didn't just shut it off. They said, we're going to turn off this backbone network, which we've been paying for for the last 10 years, so you can go buy service from the commercial internet service providers, but we will put in place and underwrite for a while the cost of network access points to make sure that the commercial networks could all interconnect. So the network access points performed the function that the NSF net had performed in terms of connectivity among the various uh, commercial networks. And so that happened in 1995. So I want to give a lot of credit to NSF for having made, taken steps both to expand the scale of the network and to help facilitate its commercialization. They also paid for international connections to link networks around uh, Europe and Asia and uh, Asia Pac and so on in order to expand the international community uh, that was capable of being part of the internet. So Bob and I in 2005 at the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and I'm not putting these up here to blow my own horn, I'm putting them up to make sure that you recognize that Bob Kahn was as much a part of this as I was. This is what the internet looks like now. It's big, it's colorful, uh, and the purpose behind the picture uh, is, is to show you not only scale, uh, there are several billion devices on the internet today, growing rapidly, they're probably on the order of three and a half to four billion users online right now. But each of these different colors is intended to represent a different network, which is independently operated from all the others. And this is what Bob and I had hoped would happen. When we did the original design, we speculated about whether we should patent this technology. Now, we're working for the government, so that's you know, sort of an odd question to ask. But we, we were concerned about being able to manage the evolution of the system. We, uh, we went through the following uh, scenario. We said, OK, we're doing this for the Defense Department for command and control. It has to work globally because the military has to go everywhere. Our allies should be able to use the same technology so that we can have a and cooperate with each other. And then we're thinking this in 1973, we're thinking, okay, so who are our allies now? There's this list. And then we got to thinking, so who are our allies 25 years before that? And that was a different list. And then we thought, well, what about 25 years from now? We didn't know the answer to that. So we concluded that there was no way to pick and choose which countries to share the technology with. So we decided to release it publicly. And astonishingly, no one objected. Of course, we didn't exactly ask for permission either. We just did it. <laughs> and nobody noticed, so that was good. Uh, but the idea here was that in order for this to be global in scope, we thought that anyone who wanted to could take the specifications, write software, and make it work. And we said, basically, if you can write the software to behave this way and find somebody to connect to, it should work. And so we were looking for a kind of <coughs> organic growth of the network, and that's exactly what has happened. You'll notice that we didn't dictate business models. We didn't dictate which software you use, only that the software had to meet certain standards. We didn't dictate which hardware it was to be used. All we said was, please adopt and use these standards and adhere to them. Why would you want to build a business model? We want to build out nonprofits and for profits and government operated backbones and municipal networks. And the little network you have in your, uh, in your house, all part of that picture. And it works because we were, we underspecified almost everything. Sometimes underspecification is your friend because it gives you huge flexibility. All right, so now comes the hard part, and that's the unfinished business. Well, this is a list of things that it's an, an incomplete list of things that still need to be worked on. Standards are absolutely vital because they replace pairwise negotiations with many, many different parties because everybody agrees to adopt the same standard. 
So there are a number of different institutions, some of which are listed there, that are party to developing standards for the internet. And, uh, and they are still as vital as ever. W3C being a relatively new number, uh, ITU being 150 years old, and IETF more like about 32 years old. But they all have had a role to play at some layer in the architecture of the internet for standardization. <coughs> Another thing that's important, uh, increasingly so over the internet of things, is software that can be updated in a safe and secure way. Uh, we all uh, understand that um, we have not learned how to write software that's bug free. It's kind of embarrassing. We've been programming machines for 80 years now, and we still don't know how to do it in a way that's bug free. So we know that almost any product that has software in it is going to have a bug or two or three. And we want to make sure that the design allows for updating that software. But what's important is that the device that's accepting the update has some way of ensuring itself that it's coming from a legitimate source and that the software hasn't been altered while it's on its way to do the update. And so there's clear need for end-to-end authentication, for digital signatures to validate the code. Just, just because the digital signature checks doesn't mean that the code is bug-free, but at least you got some relief that it came from a legitimate source going to a legitimate destination. There's also a great deal of utility in end-to-end -end authentication for other purposes. For example, uh, when you're using um, an account, a banking account or something on the internet, you want to make sure the bank only lets you log in and not somebody else. So there are, I don't know if I listed it here, probably not. Anyway, two-factor authentication is a very important concept because it makes it harder for someone to pretend to be you by guessing if your username or password is worse, say, I forgot my password as is trying to log into your account because they figured out what your username was. And then by clicking on that, I forgot my password button and having the system say, well, there are some secret questions here. The worst part about this is people pick questions whose answers might be discoverable by a simple web search. Or maybe you happen to know this person. So that's not a very good way of securing the system. Two-factor authentication involves a separate device and a cryptographic function. And so I'm a big fan of that as a way of protecting access control uh, to accounts. So there are lots of reasons why, uh, why, why uh, cryptography is, is our friend here. Uh, also for confidentiality, and those of us who are worried about our privacy will recognize that having cryptographic communications and when is also a very important uh, principle. At Google, uh, we've reached a point now where we're insisting on people using HTTPS, which is the security version of the uh, World Wide Web Hypertext uh, Transport Protocols. And we try to mark on our browser when you are using a site that does not use that particular uh, security method. Um, there is a little problem uh, with the uh, address space in the internet. <coughs> and that's uh, my fault in Bob's fault. Um, back in 1973, I'm mean, you know, try to exonerate ourselves a little bit. Just imagine it's 1973. You are imagining building a global scale network. Uh, you don't even know what the protocols are going to work in. And you're trying to figure out, OK, so how many termination points should we play for? So uh, we actually tried to think this through. We had just finished building the national scale ARPANET, which was not an inexpensive proposition. So we thought, OK, so we, there probably won't be too many national scale networks. How many networks will there be per country? And so we thought, well, there should be at least two, so at least some competition. Then we said, okay, so how many countries are there? And there wasn't any Google to ask at the time. So, so we guessed at 128, because that's a power of two, and that's what you know, programmers say. So two times 128 is 256, so that's eight bits of network. And then we thought, okay, so how many computers will there be for network? And we thought, remember, this is 1973 when computers were great big things that didn't move around and they were in air conditioned rooms. So we said, well, how about 16 million per network? Because that's 24 bits, and 8 plus 24 is 32, and that's a nice number. So we picked 32 bits of address space. And if you uh, do the math, that's 4.3 billion terminations. If it's densely you know, allocated, which is more than there were people in the world at the time. And I thought, well, surely that's enough for an experiment. <laughs> and, and, and indeed it was uh, until one day the experiment got loose. 
And this was around 1988, 89. Uh, I had asked for permission from the Federal Networking Council to allow commercial traffic to flow on the government backbone, specifically the NSF did. Why would I do such a thing? Well, I got to thinking that if we didn't have an economic engine behind the underlying internet, that the general public would never get access to it. Because I didn't think governments would pay for everybody's use. So I wanted to show to the commercial community that there was a business to be had in offering internet service. It was not allowed to carry commercial traffic on the NSF or DOE or NASA and so on. So I asked permission to hook MCI Mail up, which was a commercial email service that I had built for MCI in 1983. And they said, OK, for a year, you can do that. So I proceeded to build the gateway uh, to connect the two systems together. And as soon as we announced that we had a linkage between MCI Mail and NSF, uh, all the other commercial email service providers said, wait a minute, those guys can't have this special uh, position. We want access to so Telemail and Telenet and on time, Telenet and CompuServe all saying we want access to the internet too. And the government said, okay. So now all these two to four separated email carriers suddenly were connected to the internet. Then they discovered the side effect. Because they were all using the same email formats and protocols now in order to connect to the internet, all of their users could talk with all the other users of, the, of their email services, whereas before they'd be completely isolated. So that was kind of a shocker. You know, by the way, it was free. That, that, that made for a really a disruptive business model. That same year, 1989, three commercial internet services got started. UnionNet, PSINet, and SurfNet out in uh, in San Diego. And yes, it was called CERFnet. That wasn't what they intended. It was supposed to be SURFnet, because you're in San Diego, you know, what else would you do? <laughs> Except that after they got all fired up with their t-shirts and their, you know, surfing the net, uh, they, somebody discovered that in the Netherlands, a research network had called itself SURFnet. It was an acronym for a research foundation network. And they said, oh, no, no we can't call ourselves SURFnet. What should we do? Somebody says, why don't we change our name to California Educational Research Foundation Network, CERFN. And then somebody else says, maybe we should call it. So they called me up and they said, is it okay if we call our network SERFNet? And my first reaction was, you know, if they screw it up, am I going to be embarrassed? <laughs> and then I thought, wait a minute, people name their kids after other people. And if the kids don't come out right, they don't blame the people they name them. <laughs> sure, go ahead, no problem. So in July of 89, I flew out, and uh, Susan Estrada, who was the executive director at the time, and I took a bottle full of, a plastic bottle full of leather, you know, like the ones they use in the movies, and smash things over people's heads. Then we smashed this bottle of uh, leather over a Cisco router in order to launch the surfnet. Mm -hmm. So three commercial services get started in 1989. And at that point, the internet starts growing at 100% a year. And that's before the World Wide Web shows up. And that doesn't happen until 1991. And nobody notices Tim Berners-Lee releases the Mosaic browser. I'm sorry, he releases his World Wide Web browser. And nobody notices, except Mark and Reeson and Eric Nina at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, and they do the Mosaic graphic user interface. Everybody notices, they download it like crazy. Jim Clark, who had started selling the graphics, um, went out to Champaign uh, Urbana and dragged them out to the West Coast, starting Netscape Communications in 1994, but probably in 1995, the stocks went through the roof and the dot over the soda. So, we ended up in 2011, running out of IPv4 address space. However, in 1992, we were all worried about this, and so the IETF invented IP version 6 by 1996, which has 128 bits of address space. If you do the math, that's 3.4 times 10 to the 38 addresses. It's a number only that Congress can appreciate. <laughs> and, but can you imagine at the time? Uh, you know, now when people say, well, what would you do differently? I said, well, I know I would have had a bigger trust base. Can you imagine saying to somebody in 1973, uh, I need 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses in order to do my experiment? You know, it just doesn't pass the red page test. To say nothing of the size of the packet headers, which would be just enormous. 
Now we have IPv6 and about 25 to 30 percent penetration into the global internet today. We need more. And we needed more partly because of all the internet of things, cyber physical systems, devices, of which there were many billions as time goes on. Another big issue, um, realizing that I'm going to run out of time, I'm not sure. Um, this long term digital preservation deserves an enormous amount of discussion, but I'll just confine it to a few observations. Most of you in the room have mobiles, most of you have good cameras on those mobiles, most of you take many pictures uh, in the course of a day or a week. And uh, those digital objects, along with your email and your documents and spreadsheets and presentations and so on, are digital objects in our online digital universe. And if there is no guarantee that any particular instance in a particular digital medium will survive for very long, some of you remember five and a quarter inch floppy disks. You remember three and a half inch floppy disks. You remember CD-ROMs. You remember DVDs. And you realize that either that medium, how about nine, seven track and nine track magnetic tape, uh, those media either may uh, be so frail that over a period of a decade or two, the uh, bits that are recorded will go away, or you can't find a reader to read the bits even if the bits are still there. It gets worse. Sometimes those digital objects require software to be correctly interpreted, whether it's presenting an image or a movie or playing sound or executing a spreadsheet. You need a piece of software to help you do something with those bits. What if the software doesn't run on the operating systems of the day? Uh, what if the operating system developer and the application developer are out of sync? What if the application developer goes out of business? Uh, what if the application guy doesn't upgrade the application to run on new operating? There's a whole series of scenarios here where you can't run the old software. And that means that the investment you've made in creating these digital objects could be completely lost. And if we're thinking about hundreds of years, which is not unreasonable for other media, think about Bumble, last for a thousand or two years, even published books last for a hundred years, a photograph lasts for a hundred years. No digital medium that I know about has lasted that long because the digital media haven't even been around that long yet. So we have a big problem here, and it requires some serious work. Business models, technology, uh, the ability to run old operating systems, run old applications on emulated hardware, a whole series of things that need to be done that are not uh, currently regularly in place. And some people will misunderstand this as an argument that I want to save everything. No, but what I do want is that if you wanted to save something digital, then you have an option to do that, that there's a technology and a way of affordably preserving it over long periods of time. That's what I mean. There's another big problem we have. Uh, it's called the domain name system. And Tim Berners-Lee enshrined the domain name system in the World Wide Web uh, in a way which uh, now has negative consequences. The problem with domain names is that they used to be free, but then in order to maintain the business of allocating, maintaining, and correctly resolving domain names, we had to create a business structure underneath it. So people now lease domain names effectively. If you don't pay your rent, you may lose access to the domain name. It may just disappear, or someone else may get access to it. So the URLs that are embedded in the domain names may not be resolved anymore. You will all have experienced the world page not found. So think of all of the references that are currently printed in you know, you know, magazines and, and you know, reports and things like that that refer to domain names that may not resolve anymore or at the time that they're needed. So we have an unstable reference system in the online world right now. We need to do something about that. Bob Kahn has designed and is trying to propagate a uh, digital object identifier environment that would, um, does have the property that you never assign this identifier to anything else other than what it was originally connected to when you digitally sign the linkage between the two, so that that's a permanent reference to a particular digital object. You might still not be able to find it if you don't have a way of resolving it to some place in the internet. But at least you don't have the problem of the domain name that just disappears out from our view. Um, everybody here wants 
maximum bandwidth on the internet, and it's getting better and better over time, especially in the wireless domain. We're starting to see a movement up into the 60, 75, 85 gigahertz range, which means that you can get as much as five gigahertz of bandwidth at an 85 gigahertz frequency, and even if you can only get one bit per hertz, that's five gigabits per second of capacity in a wireless mode. So you, you know, the future is looking pretty bright for high-speed wireless access to the internet. Uh, and finally, another thing that's uh, really dramatic, uh, and that's this software-defined networking, which I confess to you, I thought of as a buzzword, a marketing buzzword, because you know, every router ever built has had software on it. So what's the big deal about software-defined networks? Well, to be frank about it, there is something going on that's pretty interesting. The underlying hardware uh, is basically a, a, a unlock, non blocking switch. And it doesn't really do anything unless you program it to do something. And so you're really telling the switch how to decide what to do with each packet that goes through. Some of these bare switching systems are now capable of executing as many as 4,000 instructions per packet going through the system at line speed. What does that mean? It means when the packet goes into the switch, you have 4,000 instructions to decide what to do with it. You can look at every bit in, in the packet if you want to, instead of just looking at the source and destination address. So suddenly you have an incredibly rich space of decision making going on to decide how packets should be routed through the system. So this is actually a fairly big deal. Um, I'm concerned about time. Do I need to, uh, so let's see. Why don't I think that? Well, all right, so this is officially the last slide. So let me just pick a couple of things here that I want you to be worried about like I am. That second bullet, we've already kind of implied that we have all kinds of problems with the Internet of Things, um, scaling problems where you have a couple hundred devices in the house and, and you have to reconfigure them. You don't want to spend a day typing IPv6 addresses and things. Worse, um, what if these devices control lots of different parts of the house? The 50 or so lights that are in the house, the heating and ventilation, the air conditioning system, the entertainment system, the security system, the uh, household, the kitchen appliances, and all this other stuff. Um, you know, how do you make that easy to use? Too many people in this business today think mobile, app, Wi-Fi, device, end of story. But I don't want to go into the house and be flipping through 80 different apps to figure out how to turn the light on or flush the toilet. And so you have this problem of scaling and making these devices easy to use. What do you do about guests? The guest comes into the house and you have to introduce the house to the guests so the guests can actually use the house. And you know, there's multiple no lights that are in here. You don't want to get into a big debate with the house about which one you're trying to turn on. And so I suppose you could give them names like Frank and George and Eddie, because then you have to teach your guests, you know, which is Frank and George and Eddie. That doesn't sound too good. And how do you unintroduce them to the house when they leave? How do you distinguish between the casual guests that you want to have control over the house and the you know, the landscaper guy who should have little or no control over the house. What about parents and kids? You know, the kids shouldn't have the same control as the parents do. Of course, that's typically true. They have more control than the parents do. <laughs> they know how to get around. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I don't want to belabor this too much, but the point here is that we are at the leading edge of complexity and scale in the Internet of Things, and we are going to live through some pretty interesting times trying to figure out how to make this easy to use. Everybody here understands that once you let the general public into this open and online network environment, that you get everything that Shakespeare told us about, all the, all the people who do not have your best interests at heart. That's why we still read Shakespeare 400 years later. So we have misinformation, disinformation, all kinds of the fake news and, and the false facts and so on, or, or alternative facts. We have a whole new vocabulary to explain what's going on. Bullying and all the other things, fraud. There's, there's a lot of bad things that happen in there. And the question is how do we preserve all of those positive benefits to sharing of information, the discovery of people with common interests, the ability to learn, the ability to contribute, while also protecting people from the 
harms that can occur on the network, how do we protect their human rights, how do we protect their privacy, how do we protect their safety, and the like, while at the same time uh, trying to uh, keep this as open as possible so that people can continue to contribute their ideas and their knowledge to this environment. So I'm, I don't have a good solution to the problem except to make one observation. There is one facility that we all have. It's called wetware. And if we can train the wetware to think critically about what we're seeing and hearing, then we may be able to defend ourselves against people who are trying to mislead us and misrepresent what's going on. The trouble is that takes work. And so we need to teach kids early on that critical thinking is their friend and that they should exercise it. Some families don't like that because the kids come home and they start questioning their family's position on things because that's what critical thinking is all about. But in my view, that may be one of the primary ways in which we defend ourselves against some of these bad things. We can try to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to filter content, but I don't think we'll ever get to the point where those kinds of tools work as well as good thinking up here in the web range. Uh, let me just pick the two, two other bullet points here. Uh, the internet is a global system. It was designed to be that way. It was not designed to recognize national boundaries for a number of reasons, not the least of which is they keep changing. So if we're trying to uh, protect people from harm in the network, we have to recognize the harm that comes from anywhere. It crosses international boundaries. It crosses boundaries inside the country. And so the consequence is that we will require international agreements and mechanisms for law enforcement in order to protect everyone from harm in this online environment. That means collaborative and international uh, treaties uh, in order to execute that. And the last point I want to make about ethics and software-based systems. Um, I have made my living over the years writing software, not so much anymore, but certainly in the past. And I think it is unethical to release software knowing that it has bugs. Now, if you're still going to release software that has bugs that you didn't know about, I certainly have been my share of those. Most of them are the head slapping kind where you finally see the bug and you go, how can I be so stupid? Um, but the point here is that I think ethics is very important here. I want everyone who is responsible for writing software or responsible for designing systems that use software to feel a huge ethical burden to protect against mistakes, to find ways of making sure you can fix mistakes when they occur, and to think about products that are going to be used over a period of time, like IoT devices that might be in the house for 20, 30 years, to make sure there is a way to fix the bugs that show up. And so ethics is something that we should be teaching uh, in our engineering school, in addition to all the technology and everything else. Because if we don't do that, we will all suffer from bad quality software, which will cause great trouble. So gosh, that's sort of a dead note to hand out, but I'll, I'll stop there and tell you that that's important to worry about. Thank you again for your time. I have a few minutes if you wish. We have a microphone here that I'll run a little bit. But in any case, thank you very much for your time. Bitcoin, and that technology is enabled by a distributed ledger called the blockchain. Yes. Could you offer an opinion on distributed ledgers and uh, blockchain specifically? Yes. Okay. So, well, first of all, with regard to Bitcoin, my answer is run the other way. Uh, now, having said that, there are people who made a lot of money on Bitcoin. There are probably a lot of people who also lost a lot of money on Bitcoin either because you know, the variability of the value is so high, or they lost their bitcoins, like now docs. So uh, the thing that's important here is that uh, none of these uh, cryptocurrencies have any intrinsic value. And they are so variable that the, uh, the IRS here in the US treats them as if they were commodities, like pork bellies and things like that. So I would not accept payment in pork bellies for almost anything that I would do, <laughs> unless I was really hungry for a bait and lettuce and tomatoes. 
So now that's the, the cryptocurrencies. Uh, and I know that there's huge money right now. Blockchain is an underlying technology. Uh, it is not, this is, don't conflate blockchain with the Bitcoin mining, for example, which is a mechanism for trying to pay for the cost of building and operating a lot of very high power hardware. Uh, blockchain has some limitations. Um, one of them is the rate at which you can form blocks. It requires cooperation among all the parties so that they decide who signs the next block. Because only one party should do that. You can't have multiple parties signing the next block or you end up with a fork in the blockchain and then they lose the utility of it. Um, I think there are a lot of people who become fascinated by the mechanics of blockchain and have ignored the fact that a lot of the things that you might do, which is keeping track of a whole bunch of transactions historically, uh, could be done in other ways. It's, 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 it's distributed uh, ledger, effectively. Um, in some cases, you have to remember everything in order to validate a transaction which may have taken place a long time ago. For certain applications of blockchain, where value is the only metric, it's possible to foreshorten the amount of blockchain you have to remember currently, as long as you can keep, I know we're getting down in the weeds here, but as long as you can keep certain instances of the earlier summaries of the earlier blockchain, you may, you may be able to avoid remembering everything. But it, this is a fairly complicated and sophisticated thing to do. The thing which the blockchain doesn't solve is the one where the transactions that are in the blockchain, for example, a real estate transaction, or I purchase a painting from you of some value. It's not the value that was important, it's the fact that the transaction that's important. I may keep that painting for 50 years as a fact of that transaction needs to be visible to the party that I ultimately sell the payment to later. So this isn't about money anymore. This is about keeping track of the transactions that have occurred. So when somebody says you don't need to remember everything, they're only taking the cases where you can summarize value because you can take value and add it all up and it's okay to remember what the sum was. It's not true for real estate, for paintings, and for other objects that, uh, that are not represented simply by uh, numbers. So I am cautious about blockchain. We use blockchain methods, including for certain small size applications. So um, I am personally very, very skeptical about the level of hype that blockchain has reached. So I would be cautious about someone offering investments in blockchain, for example or even arguing that you should solve the problem with it without asking some pretty severe questions about scale, about how much you have to remember, about how you protect the objects that are recorded in the blockchain, about which transactions are recorded in the blockchain. So this is why, for example, even in the Bitcoin case, you run into the problem where the blockchain has been correctly implemented. You can validate that this particular transaction occurred, but the Bitcoin itself could be stolen because the security of the wallet that it was put in was weak. And so we, uh, we have to help for people who don't want to go to the trouble of understanding the details of this. We have to keep people reminded that there are important factors that either make this a safe or less safe um, technology. And that it's not magic, it's not pixie dust, you know, just expecting like Bitcoin or, or blockchain on top of something. So I'd be very, very cautious about that side. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. Well, we got behind you has the microphone. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. But you can signal, you can signal, because he's got the Go ahead. Thank you very much. That was a very, very enlightening talk. Um, so you mentioned misinformation and disinformation, and that people essentially haven't changed in the last 400 years, so probably well, in the last 2,000 years, and that there will be nasty things. So now there's lots of discussion that this is a new thing. But I mean, essentially, haven't we dealt with some of this already through mass media? We, we printed newspapers, there was a lot of propaganda and things like this. So how much are the problems that we're currently seeing the same as we've seen for the past 150 years? And how much do you think is it new problems? Yeah, it's a very good question. And it's absolutely true that we've had to deal with misinformation and disinformation and propaganda campaigns and everything else in the other media. Uh, we did it with, in fact, the Americans engaged in that with RFE, you know, Free Europe, or Radio RFE, or, you know, all those other things. So, to so 
say I'm going to be all press and person is favored and so on and so forth. So the answer is yes, we do counter exactly this in the other media. The things that make this a little harder are that the propagation of the disinformation is being done using a tool called a computer. And those computers are capable of doing things in the, uh, we use the digital or virtual world that we could not afford to do, would not do in the physical world. So, uh, for example, uh, when you have a botnet that's capable of spreading huge amounts of disinformation and skewing any statistical without an attempt to figure out what's valid and what isn't, that's making this different. It's messing up machine learning algorithms that are trying to figure out where is this stuff coming from, especially if you can't tell a lot from a human being. Now, when you think about uh, the problems that YouTube or Facebook or some of the other Twitter have, think about their software interacting with something out on the net. The, the, media, the medium of their interaction is identical, whether it's a botnet or a human being. And I know we've all been annoyed by captures and things where they ask you to type what is this funny number or steer this way or it's pronounced, it drives us all crazy. Um, even there, uh, the botnets have figured out how to fight that problem by taking the image that they're being challenged to identify and sending it to somebody else and paying them to figure out what it is and then sending it to them. So the software which is confronted with the botnets is having trouble distinguishing a bot from a human being. And so and now we have, and humans are perfectly capable of misinformation. You know? This is not in dispute. The problem is scale and quantity, and, and any attempt by artificial intelligence needs to distinguish. So I think we do have a different problem now than we had before, because the tools that we might have used to help us figure this out are not helping as much as we would like. So here I'm still very worried about um, what to do. Which is why I still think critical thinking is such a wonderful uh, response, because at least we have our brains that can ask, where did this come from? Uh, can, it be, is, can anything be corroborated? Uh, was there some motivation for putting this up in the place where it is that I could you know, determine to try to steer me in the wrong direction? So I think we're in a different space than we were before, which means that we have to do something about it. OK. Where, who's that? Oh, there we go. OK. Yeah. Don't forget their hands over there, too. Go ahead. Good, a very good talk. Um, what really scares me is the internet of Trump. Um, I have seen friends have a number of uh, really weird incidences in which cameras would s start spewing data on some port and not shut off until you turn it off. You know, stuff like that. It was all bugs, we think, but it still it was a problem. What do you think? is the best mechanism to force people, or companies, to start writing better software. You can all write points about maintainability in the future, but how do we get people to do that? I mean, I kind of loathe to see government stick its tentacles yeah. uh, into that. But it's occurring to me that that's the only actual process. Well, so, so let's analyze this for a minute. Um, this is this is almost a life lesson for students to take from the question. Think for a minute about something that you see, some behavior that you don't like, and, and your reaction is we should try to do something about it. The first question you need to ask is not why do I like this or not like this, but what is the incentive that is driving the behavior? And then we have to ask ourselves, is there some other incentive that will drive the behavior that we want? And then we have to ask, is there a way for me to change those incentives in order to drive the behavior we want? So let's think for a minute about uh, unethically bad code, for instance, or other bad behaviors on the net. If, if there are incentives that will drive that behavior away, one thing to do is to make it too costly. Uh, another one, for example, is to have liability associated with this. There's, there's a so there's a, a generic way of dealing with this problem. This is not the solution with the example of the pieces. The first way that you deal with bad behavior in this space is to find technical means to inhibit that bad behavior. So uh, for example, being able to detect a botnet and either shut it down or filter it out is a technical response. 
not, uh, well, not all such bad behavior would be prevented by these technical means. So what's the next thing we can do? Well, we can say that there are certain behaviors that we in our society agree is unacceptable. And we will say there will be consequences if, if we discover you or something you have created is behaving that way. Again, we won't catch everybody. But by putting someone on notice that there will be consequences, uh, that can have an effect. For example, remember seatbelts. There was a time, believe it or not, when seatbelts were not part of cars. And we showed young drivers all the bad things that happened if you didn't have a seatbelt on and you had a collision and you were, you know, what you really know got killed. That wasn't enough, however, to influence people's behavior. The next thing they did was to tell the automobile manufacturers, you're not selling a car without a seatbelt in this country. End of story. Then they said to the drivers, by the way, if we catch you driving without a seatbelt, there will be consequences. So we had incentives and enforcement. The same thing is uh, true for smoking. We went through that whole cycle. So it may very well be that either regulation or law enforcement or something will be needed in order to say to people, if we catch you doing behaviors that we in our society believe are unacceptable in this online environment, that there will be consequences. Now, all those two things, the technical preventions and the consequences, are still not enough because we can catch everybody. So what's the third thing we can do? Well, we can say to people, don't do that. It's wrong. Now, that sounds kind of weird. But I want to remind you about something. The weakest force in the universe is gravity. But when you get a big mass, it's really powerful. So when there is a large consensus in a society about behaviors, and which ones are acceptable or not, sometimes that pressure can be quite powerful. And you can inhibit some bad behaviors that way. I think you need to use all three of those things in some measure or other in order to cope with the problems that we have. OK. Question in the okay. Um, I would like to ask you some advice for the research directions in the wireless networks. There are many technologies have been proposed um, uh, for the 5G networks, uh, wireless networks. For example, some cognitive kind of radio, mini wave, uh, MIMO, things like that. So what is your opinion and advice on the directions? To all those technologies, what are the real technologies can be really implemented on the potential to do more research on that? So, yeah. uh, if, if it's okay for me to respond now with just a set of research directions that I think would be beneficial, would that be okay? Yes. All right. So, okay. um, here's one that I wish that we could really pursue hard, and that's software development systems that will help me from uh, prevent me from making stupid mistakes. So what I want is a little artificial intelligence on my shoulder while I'm writing the program. And as I'm typing the program, it says, you just created a buffer overflow. Why do you mean I created a buffer overflow? Look at line number 123. All right. And lo and behold, I've discovered that I've done something stupid. Or I'm referring to a variable that hasn't been set yet, so I get a random branch. Or I'm off by one in some camera somewhere. We ought to have software that's good enough to understand the flow of control in the program and at least point out to us where we made mistakes. Now, failing that level of artificial intelligence, at the very least, I'd like to be able to ask questions about my program and have the, this uh, augmented computer programming environment be able to respond. For example, I might say, uh, I would like to assert that there are no variables in the program that are referenced without being set. And the system should be able to actually answer, yes, I can confirm that, or no, I don't have enough information to do that, or um, C-127, you know, or any mistake. I'm looking for better software production environments. So that's one area of re serious research. Uh, the second thing, uh, it has to do with scaling in the Internet of Things. And that's figuring out how to allow people to, to manage and control and interact with a large number of devices in a way that is not overpoweringly hard. And I think there's a lot of user interface work to be done here. There's a huge amount right now of attention being paid to voice interaction with devices. And it's all very sexy and exciting. But I don't want to have to have a debate with my house about which light I want to turn on. Uh, sometimes I would like uh, the ability to send an email to my, or to my 
by an artificially intelligent assistant, or speak something, or send a text, or just walk over to the screen and say, turn this light on. Or even better, could I just point to the light and say, turn the damn light on. There ought to be a way for us to get past some of the clumsiness and, and weakness and limitations of the current paradigms for control of the Internet of Things. Uh, third thing, which is super hard, is figuring out how to introduce strong authentication in a way that's uh, implementable, comfortable. Uh, I said earlier in the talk, I said it was about two-factor authentication. Uh, I carry this dongle around at Google because I can't get connected into any of my systems without the second factor, so the cryptographic generator. And I do the same thing with some of the banks that I deal with, like Barclays Bank. When I, I got an account, they sent me a little gadget, and it does digital signatures so that I can either identify myself or digitally sign the transaction in a way that the receiving party can't alter and change the amount of money or the account it's going to. And I'm feeling really good about that. And then I realized that I have 300 accounts on 300 different systems, and I would need a bag of doubles this big to carry around wherever I go. So suddenly I need something that will allow me to have my identities all in you know, one device so that it's convenient for me. You now I don't have to worry about what happens if I lose that device, and now there's this backup question and so on. That's another area, though. It's a scaling problem that needs to be solved. The other problem that I mentioned was about digital preservation. There's just a raft of issues there that need to be dealt with. Uh, the uh, problem of references, identifiers and references to documents and objects in the digital space, that needs to be solved. The digital object architecture that Bob has worked on, how you work on maybe part of that solution, for example, there's still plenty more to be done. I mean, I can just go on and on and on and on here. Uh, the last thing I would say, though, is that we need to make sure that people who are interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence are conscious of how critical these technologies are. As spectacular as machine learning has been, and we have made breakthroughs in the last decade that, you know, it's just amazing how about the AlphaGo thing that played uh, four out of five games against Lee Sigo and won all three games in China. Very impressive performance. Then Alpha Zero came along, learned how to play Go at Grandmaster level in just a few days, from starting from zero, from having no knowledge of anything except the rules of the game, no samples of any other playing games, learned how to play chess in three hours, <coughs> better than any other computer playing chess game, not the Grandmaster humans, but any other computer chess game in three hours. Sounds spectacular, and then there's self driving cars, you know, combine all kinds of things. Sounds great. Now, um, the classic example of the machine learning algorithm is, is image uh, <laughs> distinction, like cats and dogs. So imagine that you've been training your multi layered neural network to look at a whole bunch of different animals, you know, cats, dogs, kangaroos, and cows, and horses, and so on. And it's really working tremendously well. You show it all these images, and it gets them right 100% of the time. And then somebody comes along with one of those images and they altered three or four pixels in the image. I'm sure it looks like a dog to you, but to the computer, it looks like a kangaroo. And your reaction is, well, no, what the hell? How did that happen? And the answer is, in, in the simplest lay terms that I can offer you, uh, is that those three pixels in the image were key to certain weights in the machine learning algorithm that caused this thing to be, you know, to, to be a cat over here and a kangaroo over there. And it's this grownness that we can't necessarily predict, which means that the machine learning algorithms may fail in very spectacular ways when we least expect it. And so now the research problem is how to detect those conditions and how to mitigate against them so we don't rely on machine learning algorithms to make decisions without human intervention. And the autonomy of these things could be pretty serious. So that's my rapidly constructed laundry list of stuff to do for PhD dissertations in 2020. <laughs> I guess we're out of time. Thank you very much. And I think uh, 
you can stay around a little while. We're going to have a reception outside, so I know there are others who have questions. I'm sorry, Mitch, but hopefully we can talk about Well, I'll be happy to just chat over a cup of tea. So uh, and just again, I mean, I, uh, far be it for me to congratulate Google, but I just found out today that uh, uh, it is not only Quello's 20th anniversary, but it's Google's 20th anniversary. <laughs> not, it's not today, but this year. This year, this year exactly. Well, and uh, so, anyway. Uh, can, I tell you, can I tell you one other anniversary that this is? Uh, okay, so 20 years ago, my colleagues and I had the Judge Propulsion Laboratory started working on the subject of the interplanetary internet because we had just seen the Pathfinder rover land in 1997. So we started the design in 1998. We went through four iterations. In 2004, the Spirit and Opportunity landed. They were supposed to communicate direct to Earth from the surface of Mars. The radio was overheated. We had to back off on the new recycle. There was only 28 kilobits a second available in the first place. The scientists are all up in arms because they're not getting all the data back anymore. And one of the guys says, you know, we have an x band radio on the rover. And the orbiters that we put in, in space before we map the surface of the planet to figure, to figure out where the rover should go also have X band radios on them. So we took the prototype software, the interplanetary internet, and uploaded it into the rovers and the orbiters. And ever since 2004, all the data coming back from Mars has been going store and forward through the orbiters, which we grab the data from the, from the rovers, hold on to it. So they got to the right place in their orbit and sent the data into the deep space net. Now, the x band radios couldn't go all the way back to Earth, but it's only a few hundred miles to the orbiter, 128 kilobits a second, because of that signal to noise ratio. The orbiters are outside of the atmosphere with bigger solar panels, 128 kilobits a second back in the deep space net. So now we have this storm forward network that gives four times more data back than we had before. Perfect example of why packet switching is a good idea. We've iterated on this stuff. Uh, we now have the latest protocols running at the International Space Station. We've been doing examples of controlling in real time a rover in, in Germany from the International Space Station because the distance is slow, is low, so the latency is low. So you can actually steer the thing around. You couldn't do that between Earth and Mars because the round trip time is 40 minutes. By the time you find out the rover went over the planet, it's too late. <laughs> so, so we have been testing the interplanetary protocols uh, in real-time environments and non-real-time, highly delayed environments or disruptive environments. And NASA has just launched a 90-day study to prepare to put these now standardized interplanetary protocols into use on all the spacecraft in the 2020s period. It's open source. Anyone can use it. The other space variations have agreed to stand by. And so this is the 20th anniversary of that project, too. So 98 is a big deal. <laughs> All right, so that's it. <laughs>